necessary. <laughs> it's necessary. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am to introduce the next session. The following session is um, dedicated as a tribute to our colleague Michael Mangini, who um, died last year, um, having lived among us um, uh, um, 58 years, I think. He born in 1958. And died last year, so as I count, if I count well, it is 58 years. And uh, nobody of us can die without leaving behind um, some footprints. And we are here just to remember this prince, because um, at least myself, twice meeting him during our conferences here in Huntington, I always experienced his friendship. So I think that we should begin this uh, meeting with prayer and uh, just asking our merciful Father to receive him into his um, heavenly home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the eulogy of Michael Mangini, written by Dennis Pshivara, will be read by Dr. Rettler. Please, the floor is yours. I'm uh, very happy that Father Pavel was here to pronounce uh, the pastor's name correctly. <laughs> Having, uh, we seem, uh, wherever we go, to be surrounded by Polish colleagues and uh, who uh, uh, help us out <laughs> uh, in a lot of the different activities with which we are involved. Uh, let's say I want to start uh, by reading a... Um, a message that Michael's wife, Susan Mangini, uh, sent me. And uh, Susan and Michael were uh, students of mine uh, at St. John's and um, St. John's University uh, in the 1980s. And uh, let's see, so I want to locate students yeah uh susan says uh, dear dr redpath thank you so much for this email and for letting me know about the session you plan devoted to michael this is a bit under the wire as far as remarks and i actually thought that i'd missed the date so perhaps it will be for your ears only at this point but i can say this much anyone who spoke at any length with michael in the last years of his life would have heard him profess that he was a sinner, forgiven, and at peace with the Father only through the sinless life and shed blood of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that he preached to himself every day and in which he put his trust. Of the many truths Michael explored and studied, this is the one truth about our condition and God's grace, which he recognized as the most important one to be shared, and he shared it in love of his neighbor. I'm sure that if Michael had a chance to leave any parting remarks himself, they would be of Jesus, who, is, who he is, what he did, and what he does for us. Thank you for your kindness and for honoring Michael at the Congress. Best regards, Susan Mangini. Then Susan followed it up with this. Uh, one more thing to add, not least in importance, but again, perhaps for your eyes only here, are the verses Michael referred me to a few years ago when he was asked how to comfort a dying friend. Michael knew uh, where we are invited to go through the words of Jesus. I am greatly comforted by this, as I know others would be also. His favorite book was Revelation 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe 
is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he was blessed. Uh, he has blessed us in the, the, the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And then we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise to Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who, has, who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write these down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Revelation 21, 1 to 6, regards Susan. Uh, and uh, uh, it was fitting to read that right at the beginning because it's with that scripture reading that Dennis Prisvara, uh began his, uh, uh, his eulogy uh, related to Michael. And one of the things I found fascinating in, in reading this eulogy, since we're celebrating... Uh, the lives of of um, great um, individuals, uh, and, and Max Wiseman, uh, uh, Michael Mangini, uh, uh, John Dealey, and uh, Michael Novak, who were all uh, friends of ours in my, one way or another in relationship to different associations to, to which we belong. Uh, uh, is the similarity of the eulogy. The eulogy could be, could be read for pretty much any one of them, uh, uh, describing their personalities. I, I found it um, a pretty, not only interesting, but kind of shocking uh, in a way. So, uh, um, Pastor Prisvara starts out by saying that, uh, his name is Dennis. He's pastor of the Lif Lif Lincroft Bible Church. Uh, uh, and his wife and he have been friends with Michael and Susan Mangini for quite a few years now, maybe 10, 12. And so Susan asked, uh, asked him to come to say a few words, uh, which he remarks is always difficult at a time like this, but it's especially hard on this occasion because what can you say about Michael Mangini? He was one of the most unique, talented, and in many ways special individuals uh, uh, that uh, I, he's ever known and I've ever known. His life was so varied and different, so unconventional that I've only known him for the, and I've only known him for the last 10 or 12 years. And uh, so I thought about today, uh, as, I th as I thought about today, I wondered how do I capture all of that in just a few minutes? You know him, right? It's not easy. But as I thought about it, 
I concluded that all the things that made Michael Mangini who he was, uh, all the things that made him who he was, there are three that really sum him up for me. Big heart, powerful intellect, and he lived his life on his own terms. Now, that could describe Max, that could describe John Dealey as well, certainly could describe Dealey. Uh, uh, Novak, Michael Novak too. Huh? Uh, and um, uh, the um, uh, big heart, he was generous, kind, could be like a big teddy bear. And to watch him with Susan brought out that brought all of, uh, that out of him all the time. Powerful intellect. He had a formidable mind. He thought deeply about things, especially things which mattered. He was certain of what he believed in, and if not, he made it his goal to dig it into it so he could be certain. And he would challenge you to do the same. And he lived on his own terms. Whatever it was he was doing, Michael was all in. Scary, all in. Scary all in at times, but whatever it was that Mike was doing, he did it big, and he did it on his own terms. Michael understood the principle of virtual quantity. I mean, <laughs> uh, he, the way he believed uh, it ought to be done, and so that does it for me. Big heart, big mind, and he lived life on his own terms um, uh, by his convictions. He was a man of convictions. And those three characteristics would combine in ways that sometimes drove you crazy. He could sometimes frustrate you or rub you the wrong way, but that would always be balanced out by being challenged, encouraged, and incredibly blessed, as he just loved you and gave of himself to you. And so to quote one of his mutual friends, Tom F., to know Mike was to love him. I knew him and I loved him and I considered him a good friend. And so I thought about him, as I thought about him, I realized there are many stories to illustrate it. Like the time he wanted to capture the spirit of Cajun cooking. So he had a case of crawdads put on ice and flown in from Louisiana. And then he cooked them up and served them at a Cajun barbecue he had in his backyard. This is in southern New Jersey, where I think he got the title of surly host. Because when he pushed to make things his way, he could get a little gruff. But know him is to love him, and we did. Or the time when he wanted to celebrate an authentic Greek Easter. So he went out and bought a spit, installed it, and learned how to use it, then roasted a whole lamb on it in his yard and invited all of us over for a Greek fest. And there are so many stories like those, and I'm sure you all have many of your own that have filled the conversations over the last few days. Big heart, powerful intellect, and he lived his life on his own terms. And I want to share just one today, one because I know Mike... Michael wouldn't want today to be about his life. He would absolutely want today to be about uh, what he was about. He wanted to be about the, his, the gospel, huh? about Jesus. And this story helps me get there. And so back a few years ago, I would meet Mike somewhat regularly, maybe once a month or so for lunch. Uh, we would go at a restaurant at Colt's Neck uh, called Huddy's. I, I went there with Michael myself. And Mike would invite a number of pastors he knew from the area to join him, and it was with his big heart, he'd always pay, no questions asked. And so we would have lunch, and of course, a Guinness. And we would talk about in depth and breadth the gospel, and especially about the many implications it has in our lives, and for us pastors in our churches. And Mike would bring that big intellect to bear on whatever the topic of the day was, and he usually bring the topic with him. He lived life on his terms, remember. So... He would very often start the conversation, and he would challenge us to think deeply about it right along with him. Those were challenging and influential conversations for me. But there was one time that I recall, and we were having lunch and talking, uh, talking that the topic turned to uh, Martin Luther. Luther, as you may know, was the central figure in the Protestant Reformation. Huh? And as a powerful time in church history when the gospel ignited great changes in the established church. And Luther was right at the center of those changes. Huh? Uh, it fits nicely into our, uh, our uh, conference topic. Huh? Uh, so it wasn't unusual for his name to come up in our conversation. And at one point, and I don't remember the details, we talked about the fact that the Catholic Church at the time referred to Luther as a wild boar loose in the vineyard. Now that description could sometimes be used of Michael. 
And we joked about this. And you know what I mean if he ever got loose in your vineyard. <laughs> Meaning if he ever challenged the deeply held conviction of or tradition of yours. But in this case, Michael really liked the idea of this description characterizing our lunches. And so he thought it would be great if we had wild boar for lunch the next time we met. <laughs> that would sort of symbolize what those lunches were about. But believe it or not, wild boar isn't on the menu over there at Huddy's. And so for most of us, I think it would never go past a lighthearted conversation, but not Michael. He lived life on his own terms. So he found out where he could get wild boar. He got it shipped in, uh, brought it to Huddy's, and somehow convinced the cook to prepare it for us. So there we were the very next time at Huddy's discussing the gospel and eating wild boar. That was Michael Mangini, <laughs> big heart. Huh? He did it all, and uh, he did all the work and paid for it all himself, then simply invited us to join him. Life on his own terms, a wild boar for lunch. So that's pretty much like our organization. You know? <laughs> so what if it's not this not not on the menu? Huh? He'll get it on the menu. Powerful intellect. All of it grew out of his tireless pursuit of the truth of the gospel. That's why we were meeting at Huddy's in the first place, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you spent time with him, you knew this was what uh, his life was all about, because when Michael encountered the gospel, he didn't just think about it, he believed it. And the more he thought about it, the more convinced he was it was true. His focus in life was on the gospel of Jesus Christ. His heart for people was driven for it. His passion for theology and philosophy was centered on it. Huh? Uh, and his conviction uh, in how to live grew out of it. And that's what he absolutely would want to focus today to be on, not on himself, huh? like Max Wiseman said, huh? not on him, but on the center. Huh? Uh, but in this case, uh, on Jesus, and which would be the center, right? Uh, and as big as gospel is, as deep and profound as the truth of it goes. And if you've ever had the pleasure of having one of those conversations with Mike, you caught a glimpse of the richness, richness of the gospel, but as complicated as those conversations could get, he never allowed that to overshadow the fact that at its core, the gospel is simplicity itself. And no matter what practical application or theological point he was challenging me on, it always came back to the basics, to the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel always comes down to this, the perfect life of Jesus offered up in his sacrificial death on the cross, followed by the victory of his resurrection, and all of it being done to offer forgiveness for our sins and promise of eternal life, perfect life. Michael knew he wasn't perfect, and neither am I, uh, or, nor any of us, in fact. And if you think back on that description of the new creation I read to start with, no more tears or sorrow or pain or death, when you think that through, you'll realize that the people there must be perfect. Otherwise, that new place will end up looking a lot like this old one. Something needs to change, and that something is all of us. It just makes sense. But more than that, we need to be perfect because God is perfect. And as the perfect judge, he will carry out perfect justice. As an attorney, Michael understood this too. In fact, I think we all do because wherever we see a serious wrong being committed, Deep down, we cry out for justice. The problem is this, is that a perfect God will execute perfect justice toward us. It has to be that way. And so your imperfections, which is sin, will cause the perfect justice to, fa to fall on you and disqualify you from God's presence, from that new heaven and new earth that we read about. We need to be perfect, and we're not. But Jesus was. He did what none of us is able to do lived a perfectly, uh, a morally perfect life. Uh, but then Jesus offered his perfect life for us. He took our place in judgment. That's what the cross is all about. Jesus dying in our place through his death, perfect justice was carried out. Uh, and if we accept this, then his death pays for our sins. By believing uh, he did this, we are forgiven for every sin we've committed uh, and, and, uh, uh, and will ever commit. Huh? Uh, the, the perfect and eternal sacrifice of Jesus will settle our debt with God. We're forgiven, but there's more. 
Because he was perfect and because he was God, his sacrifice was accepted, and the proof of that lies in the resurrection. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. And not only does that signify acceptance of that sacrifice, it opens the way for us to follow Jesus into that new and perfect life. In him we are becoming and will one day be perfect. That's resurrection, the death of the old and birth of the new promised life, eternal life with him. And all of it is ours if we simply would accept it. That means to believe it and take God at his word. And Michael believed this. And the more he studied it and thought about it, the deeper that faith grew. And as a result of that faith, he didn't fear death. He was ready for it much sooner than any of us would have liked, but it happened quickly and while he was doing what he loved to do, helping a friend. Uh, but as sudden as it, was, as, as it was, he was ready for it because he believed that what Jesus said is true. And to drive the point home, let me share the words of Jesus himself on this subject. It comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus is attending a funeral. In fact, it's about to perform, he's about to perform perhaps his greatest a recorded miracle. He was about to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, and he arrives on the scene. As he arrives there, he was he has this conversation with Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who's distraught over losing a brother. And so when he she sees Jesus, Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to him, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What a great question that Jesus asks that grieving sister. Huh? It's the same question I'm asking you today on the very similar questions. Do you believe this? I know it's the only question Michael would leave you with today. What will you do with his gospel, with his Jesus, with his perfect life, sacrificial death? Huh? and his victorious resurrection offered for the forgiveness of your sins and to give you a promise of eternal life. Because if you believe this, if you believe this, that Jesus is resurrection and the life, then you will not only see Michael again, not only will your sadness give way to hope, but more than that, you will see Jesus and be with him forever, perfect, and in a perfect new creation, a place where things will be, as we know, deep in our hearts they ought to be. No more sadness or pain or death because God will be our God and we will be with him forever. So you need to take that question and answer it. Do you believe this? And one final point. If you believe this, that Jesus is telling you the truth here, then God, the perfect judge of all humanity, the giver of life and the one to whom all life returns, will become your heavenly Father. And so with that thought, I'd like to close by praying together this prayer that Michael's, that was Michael's absolute favorite prayer taught to us uh, uh, by Jesus, the Lord's Prayer, or as it's sometimes called, the Our Father. And so if you've made your choice to believe, to believe in him, you can pray this prayer, maybe for the first time, I doubt it, here, uh, not from memory and not by, by rote, but from the heart, because you will pray to a God who is your Father, uh, would you join me in this? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. And then uh, the end and citation comes from Romans 8, 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And go in peace. And uh, uh, just, uh, I don't know if we can get a, does this come up, this photo of Michael? Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. Senator, uh, that was Michael Mangini, our, our colleague and friend. Uh -huh. And now, uh, what I think we, uh, we could do is have a panel discussion. For those of you who weren't, uh, weren't able to know, get to know Michael, on some of the topics uh, that, uh, 
were discussed in the uh, in this uh, uh, reflection on the life of Michael Langini. So I'll turn, sit down, and we can converse about that. And anything especially that might have caught your attention. I still have Michael's paper that he gave at the first session here. And it's an extraordinary paper on John Dewey, carrying it to uh, scripture. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the time I finished reading his paper, I was convinced that John Dewey was basically a loser. <laughs> well, that's the, you know, John John suggested to me one day, he said, you know, that the way that the church could solve this problem with Protestantism was to canonize Luther. <laughs> well, that's, that's the last thing you I think he suggested that to a bishop. <laughs> the question is, how will Luther approve that? But, uh, but last, uh, last year before, we had a, a, I don't want to ever forget this, John and I, the, the casual, that's just my want. Uh, started a mildly debatable topic on liturgy, and it got more heated and, and heated. And uh, and I was uh, promoting contemporary worship, and uh, I was I still am very impressed with a lot of the evangelical stuff. I go, my wife goes to a congregation of uh, eight thousand members. We have the screen and all the different services, and, uh, and uh, that's why I was holding forth on why this was, why we had to look more at this, and the more I did, the more red in the face that Michael got. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, I'm talking to a solo script tour guy, and not only was Michael a Lutheran, he was a Missouri Lutheran, and that, that's hardcore Lutheran. And, uh, and that night, I bought Michael most close to a heart attack. <laughs> but, uh, but to me, that really uh, highlighted the, the brilliance of Huntington, okay? That you could have this incredible, and we, we use words like dialogue and dialectics, like it's a, supposed to be a sweet, gentle thing. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy here at that time from Holy Apostles, he was the uh, IT guy, okay? And uh, he didn't know anything about philosophy. He was just here to observe the genre. Yeah, John. yeah. And then he said to me, "Breckley, he said, he said, well, I'm trying to understand what you philosophers do." He said, "I was watching you and Mangini last night. Do you just get together and scream at one another?" <laughs> I said, "But you're starting together." <laughs> and, and I was talking to a, a professor who teaches Buddhism. He actually was a Buddhist and a Tibetan Buddhist or something. I think it was a monk guy. He said, you know, there's, there's forms of Buddhism where the, the monks will go into the yard and they will argue for hours and scream and holler at one another about an interpretation of, of, of the text, okay? Sounds like Italian Buddhism. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we have, this, we have this myth, okay, that dialogue and dialectics is this calm um, thing that's going to unite the world. We unite the world with a lot of screaming and hollering and arguing and working points to it. And uh, so I, I never, I'll never forget that evening and then the next day it was like, and that guy who was observing said, well, is that what you do when you're doing philosophy? And uh, I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I miss Michael. I miss him not being here because I, I, I love to uh, have a dispute topic with him. That was nice. Well, remember, he got annoyed at us because we defended Joel Austin. Oh, oh, don't, don't bring that up. I mean, that was... I thought you were going to say that. I thought... Curtis and I were defending Joel Austin. So I, I said, I think that Joel is fundamentally an Aristotelian. And, and uh, Michael didn't have much love for Aristotle. You know, Thomas, yes. <laughs> and Curtis and I explained to him that he promotes uh, you know, well-being and happiness. And that's why he's so successful. <clears throat> but we didn't convince him. I'll never forget that. Trying to sell Michael Mangini on Joel Olstein. Huh? <laughs> Very nice, my right. One of the things that struck me about this uh, uh, this eulogy was the the number of times that uh, that Dennis uses the term perfect. 
and who are in that, the pursuit of perfection. Yeah. Uh, and as well as uh, the greatness, depth, and intensity. That's, that all of these, the, the attraction uh, you know, of these um, uh, unique individuals, people who stand, stand out not, uh, as exceptional, is this, this, this sense of some sort of equality of intensity. Uh, that St. Thomas talks about, uh, this principle of virtual quantity. Uh, that um, uh, the most, uh, the overwhelming 99% of the Thomistic scholars in the 20th century missed. They, didn't, uh, they never saw this as a, a, a principle at work uh, in his, uh, his understanding of ancient Greek philosophy. And, uh, the um, uh, uh, and it's it's crucial to to understand uh, in, in relationship to understanding the nature of an organization and the unequal the, un, the, un, the unequal qualitative talents huh, that you have within human organizations uh, uh, and how they uh, there is within these. Human organizations is pursuit of perfection, perfection of action, perfection in activity. Uh, while it's, it's it's never totally mastered, it's always you know, achieved with with maximum intensity. It's always being uh, it's always being pursued, and certainly it's, uh, it's pursued uh, in, uh, in in Michael's life. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Two, two things that struck me uh, in, um, in focusing attention on this, this, this notion uh, in St. Thomas were uh, the, um, the, the passage in, in Aristotle uh, where Aristotle cautions in, in On the Heavens uh, where he says that Small mistakes in the beginning, then uh, down the road, book one, chapter five, lead to, to major mistakes. And uh, to me, that means that small mistakes about first principles uh, uh, will eventually wind up messing up your reasoning. It doesn't really matter how much of a genius you are intellectually in, uh, in, in deducing syllogisms if you, if you have a lousy induction. Your induction about the first principle is wrong. That's what you have to be right. And that's one of the things that I think is a, is a common characteristic of the genius of Maritain and Gilson uh, and uh, uh, the Father Crowley that many of you, you know, some of you here, I've never heard about before. Uh, and um, Father Mallow, the Delia, the Delia, uh, the uh, Michael Novak, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, they, uh, Michael, Michael had it, you know, this conviction that there is you know, a, a generic, it's first recognized generically, uh, sensed. Uh, we said first sense of genus, and then we, uh, uh, then we unpack it. We we get the specific precision uh, about uh, uh, what it is that. Have first captured our attention, uh, and uh, Thomas have tended to miss that that point uh, in the 20th century. And one of the reasons that we are we have these meetings is precisely to uh, uh, to uh, to get back to the proper induction uh, uh, to the to, to principles that were missed. In, uh, uh, by uh, Thomistic scholars in the 20th century, so we can uh, uh, resolve problems that they weren't uh, they weren't able to solve. Uh, and, um, so those are some of the things that captured my uh, my attention uh, in relationship to uh, this reflection on Michael and uh, who Michael was. <coughs> um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to One of the first conferences we had here, where I met Michael, 
And we're in the faculty lounge where we have our cocktail reception. And the, it, it set out the food and drink. And Michael thought it might not be quite enough. Uh, once that said here, he didn't explicitly say, but maybe he had the wedding feast of Cana in mind. But he and a couple other people took it upon themselves to go into town and stock up on food and drink just in case. Uh, we wanted to make sure that nothing happened to spoil the, the conviviality afterwards, which is always, I think, all we find a great part of the conference, the conversation that goes on there as well. And so that was just. Yeah, that was just his immediate reaction. Uh, you know, we've got to do something about this to make sure that uh, this party is the party that we want it to Right. Yeah. He, he wanted to bring you in a case that the coin is one. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 But you know, then again, he speaks Michael's ability to. Well, I think guys like me who came to clients very late or were really professional, they weren't scholars. Points, but I use the word he began to sense something. Mm -hmm. I was talking with John, he comes from a background like I did from, from Denny, okay? That was the first paper that I presented here, it's on Denny. He sense it, but there's somehow what their principles lacking, okay? And one of the principles that Michael sensed, going on getting that line, like one of the things out in organizational studies we're doing is the, the important, there is the formal organization and the informal organization. I'll think of a Venn diagram where they overlap, okay? And the really great leader has the ability to move between the formal and the informal organization. So the cocktail hour is really the informal organization. Okay? But it's very often in that informal organization that the important conversations take place and emerging thoughts take place. And possibilities for a new paper or a new organization and so forth. And see, Michael knew that. That's why he was concerned that we can't lose the momentum from the formal lectures into the, you know, the happy hour. And I'm looking back in my memory, it's funny that, you know, much of what you have learned here, or I have learned here, is very often that how the leaves do that, right? And uh, the organizational psychologist Charles Ewing calls that finding the sweet spots, the hot spot, the sweet spot. And that happens in the genius of the leader who can move between that formal and the influence. And Michael was that kind of guy. He, you know, he, he brings the friends over, he organizes the fit, he, he gets the conversation going and so forth. But yet, he's always very, knowing Michael, he's always very focused on Christ and the Jesus point. That's the guy, everything he does, formal or informal, is coming back to that. You, read, you see that in the paper he wrote on daily, okay, in the scripture. That, that, that's the genesis right there. Okay? You have to sense all the time, even in that informal session, that Christ is at work here. Well, I picked that up from my yeah. One of the read, no? one of the other passages that uh, that caught my attention, and you jogged my memory about it when you're talking about this, uh, uh, was uh, from uh, from Saint Thomas, uh, where. Uh, I think it's in, the, in his commentary on Aristotle's Metaphysics, where he talks about the fact that um, the uh, our ability to uh, and this is really based on the notion of perfection that the eulogy talks about uh, that we can't make comparisons of of uh, more or less perfect uh, good better best unless we do it within a genius. Uh, and the uh, Father Maurer, in this uh, article that he wrote, which I think was a, a very crucial one uh, for uh, uh, modern Thomistic studies, you know, the, the, uh, St. Thomas and the Nominalists on the Unity of the Sciences, um, where uh, in the septicentenary issue of St. Thomas, where St. Thomas says that the genius of the philosopher is not the genius of the logician. Uh, the, uh, and the genus, in the genus of the logician, you don't have any analogy. <laughs> you, know, you have univocity, the mode of reasoning is univocity. The mode of reasoning for the philosopher, for the scientist, is analogy. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why 20th century Thomas couldn't understand analogy. And that 
Well, why, and now St. Thomas is teaching on analogy more or less hasn't been understood since he died. It's a very simple, a simple teaching. That's been old, it's been made, it's been complicated uh, by logicians who, who really can't deal uh, with the issue because they're not focusing attention on uh, on, a, uh, on, on what chiefly interested the ancient Greeks, uh, uh, which was action. And uh, how actions related to being able to harmonize opposites, teaching uh, teaching on opposition or within a uh, uh, within within a genus, uh, a, a real genus being composed of contrary opposites. So, uh, uh, Saint Thomas's teaching in the 20th century with his crucial principles were, were overlooked. Dealey recognized. That uh, one of those principles was, was relation. Uh, one of the one of the reasons why Dealey's thinking and my my thinking coalesce on so many different areas, even though John and I differed on a whole slew of political and other kinds of, uh, of issues. Uh, except he started to come around to it again. And was was that? St. Thomas talks about uh, four kinds of opposites. Uh, contradiction, contrariety, privation, and possession, and relation. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, in uh, philosophy, strictly speaking, doesn't deal with contradictory opposition. Uh, 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 but it does deal with privation, privation and possession, and contrary opposition and relation. Uh, and if you miss those principles, uh, in him, uh, uh, which are starting points for under, understanding the way a, 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 a plurality can be unified into an organizational whole to generate action. Uh, you can't see what he's doing in numerous passages within his work where he's constantly talking about, like Plato was. The problem of the one and the many. And you misread the history of philosophy. Which one of the things that Adler, as I said the other day in the initial talk, Adler missed the pre Socratics uh, uh, and the way in which the poets, the epistemology of what we use the term epistemology today, the epistemology of the poet was that the uh, that science is due to friendship with the gods. The reason why one poet is better than another poet, and Plato talks about this in the Eon, for example, as well as in other, a bunch of other dialogues, where the poet is constantly maintaining that, that, that he's better uh, than uh, another. This kind of study or that kind of study, precisely because it's inspired by the gods. Uh, and the ancient Greek philosophers coming after the major ones, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, are trying to get rid of that notion of poetic inspiration being the source of science. Uh, that's to a certain extent why Thales has got these two principles that, that uh, 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 you have Hudor, um, the moist you know, water is uh, in a first principle, and all things are full of gods. <laughs> because you have to explain the opposition, which you can explain. How the multitude, how the many comes from the one. Uh, so once you, uh, once you understand, if you miss, if you miss that that, uh, that initial understanding of the ancient poets, who Aristotle says in a way were philosophers, uh, they were groping for an understanding of how uh, they understood their secondary causes and things. All well, of their secondary causes and things, you just look, and they're the gods basically. Uh, you just look to the things themselves, and even the soul, the human soul, you know, has this kind of principle within it that requires you to engage in a whole reinterpretation of, the, of Western intellectual history. And so you can't say, well, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, this, this problem was a problem of in physics, and then philosophy really starts when, with the, the development of logic, systematic logic. That's Cartesian. That whole history becomes and become drawn. Uh, you have to reinterpret the, the Western intellectual history. You, you say that again. Uh, the, the human soul has this principle of organization within it. 
Yeah, because because the soul, uh, you know, has, basically has God within it, just like you know, for the ancient Greeks, anything that moves has this, you know, is, where wherever there is motion, there is life, huh? and, and this life principle. Right? So, but the the, the the ancient Greek universe is 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 one which has these intrinsic principles. Uh, and and one of the problems, uh, and one of the reasons I focused this conference and I'm talking with some, you know, I'm talking with other people in the organization about what we should focus on uh, in relationship to apologetics, was because the early church was not interested chiefly in understanding what the ancient Greeks were doing. <laughs> they were they were interested in a more or less politically, uh, uh, chiefly for apologetic reasons. Uh, to defend themselves against attacks, the you know? uh, and uh, they had a, a, a different understanding of the universe. Right? But the ancient Greeks weren't interested in, in questions about existence, you know? like Joseph was interested in. You know? so it says something radically different happened. You know, so the, the Greek focus on the natures of things and essences becomes translated into the language of existence, which is quite true. It's a magnificent discovery. But that doesn't explain to you the nature of philosophy for the ancient Greek, because the ancient Greeks are interested chiefly in the problem of unity and multiplicity and how a multiplicity can be transformed into parts of a whole. And they, they were convinced that the universe was a, an organizational whole, a genus, huh? and they occupied a specific place uh, within that organizational whole, uh, and they wanted to explain uh, understand action. And so even Aristotle's notion of substance is related to that, uh, understanding action. Right? It's sometimes said to be with the static. Well, if you, you, if you interpret it from the, st from the standpoint of, of, of logical essences and so forth, you know, you know, it, it, it appears to be static. But that's not, if, you, if you're, you're understanding in terms of a, of a communications network, uh, that is that is connect is connecting a, a principle to an end and taking a multitude huh, and, and and harmonizing it. Then it's, then it's not. Joseph's got this terrific passage in Painting and Reality where he says that the only way to unify a multitude is to order. Uh, but the only way you can order a multitude is by having that multitude unequally uh, related to a single numerically one act. Uh, which is an end. Uh, you get rid of the notion of a final cause, you get rid of the notion of organizations. <laughs> you get rid of the notion of operational organizations. You get rid of the notion of operational organizations, you get rid of the notion of leadership. And if you do that with respect to the human soul, you, uh, you, uh, you fragment ethics uh, from uh, an understanding of, uh, of virtue. Huh? And, and, and achieving qualitative perfection of the soul. Right? Uh, and uh, if, in fact, that Father Maurer has this, and he wrote this, um, he did this translation of uh, St. Thomas's commentary on Boethius' De Trinitate, two different works, uh, uh, questions one to, uh, uh, one, to one, to one and two, I think, and then three to five. Uh, and in that, in that work, in, in the, uh, the, the, the uh, the one on the, um, I think, questions three to five, maybe it's, I forget, it might go beyond five to six. Uh, uh, he talks about uh, uh, the fact that um, St. Thomas did not, and he says this too in, in, in uh, St. Thomas and Anomalous, uh, science, the Unity of Sciences, uh, that St. Thomas did not chiefly conceive of philosophy as a system. He chiefly conceived of it as a habit of the soul. Now it took me decades to figure out, wow, the implications of that. And Maurer didn't like seeing the implications <laughs> of this because it meant that certain certain interpretations that he had about uh, uh, like Christian philosophy would have to would have to be altered. Huh? Because uh, he was thinking in terms of systematic, you know, don't mixing, pro no mix propositions of, of philosophy and theology. But if you think about it as a habit of the soul, all of a sudden, philosophy becomes psychology. It becomes organizational psychology. What is it? It's a habit of the soul. So what's that? It's a psychological activity. Uh, 
Hmm. And philosophy for a Christian is governed by theology. Yeah, right. Yeah. Grace, yeah. So grace it's, is part it's, of the habit. Yeah, in your it's, life. it's a whole different psychology. You said when you say governor or guide. Hmm. Well, well, it gets it gets its form. It gets its formal nature. It's it, hmm. the formal object huh, is not being abstracted. Uh, if, as the ancient Greeks were were maintaining, uh, or at least by the time of Aristotle, uh, the um, uh, uh, it's not inspiration by the gods huh, that that is, is uh, constitutes philosophical activity, but observing the behavior of things, something that Peirce was trying to get back to, uh, for example. Different ways of observing the behavior of things, and in Aristotle, for Plato, was to recollect in some way uh, the organizational principles that are involved, uh, and for Saint Thomas, will you abstract it? Well, then, then science is is essentially an abstractive type of activity, mm -hmm. and Saint Thomas will have to come up with a new definition of science, basically, huh, in order to incorporate theology you know, as a uh, as a science. Right. And he refers to the philosophers as the God. Right. Because he doesn't call himself a Yeah. yeah. But I think what's, what's really crucial crucial about this is that uh, the, the, emphasis, the emphasis on philosophy as a psychological activity means that science is much, and, and if science and philosophy are identical, then, then the, the nature of scientific activity is much more complicated. Than the simplistic understanding of it that uh, that was generated by the Enlightenment, thinkers in the Enlightenment, and uh, the, uh, uh, what's what about modernity, postmodernity, whatever that is. Uh, the uh, and uh, uh, so um, and if if Thomists have largely missed this, uh, that, that 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 philosophy chiefly for Saint Thomas is a psychological kind of an, an, an organizational uh, principle, of both within the soul and the genus of, of philosophy, somehow includes this habit and, and some sort of organizational activity, a multitude that's unified uh, outside of the soul. Uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the this reconsideration of of, uh, of Thomism. Uh, in, in these terms, generates uh, what uh, I was initially calling a born again Thomist. How <laughs> dare you? Uh, and Bill is suggesting, well, let's call it Ragamuffin. Ragamuffin Thomist, because it's kind of. Peter, let me ask you a question. We had a conversation this morning at breakfast. And I want to bring this back to the, the person and the organization of the person, okay, the soul. We we're talking about. Uh, when you try to teach students, they, they don't read books. Okay? And then they, they got their laptop and they're all over the place. And, and you mentioned that when I listen to students get papers, it's like it's, right. it's there. And it's like they have lost this sense of uh, self-organization, self, not sure, but, self, but also self-organization. They're, 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 you can see this in their body and everything. They're all over the place. Okay? Okay. So what I'm trying to get at here is this. Principles of these metaphysical of organization just don't apply to a, a whole organization. They also apply to Bill McVeigh or anybody as we try to gain you know, organization within ourselves. So the soul really becomes this, this locus of control that, that pulls all these different. And I think that's what's happening today. We have no locus of control with Right, we lost the notion of the soul. Yeah. You know, and, and as, a, as a principle of science. I mean, we don't know how to touch it. Yeah, don't know how to get back to it. I noticed it when I was, I was teaching at St. John's. Uh, and I had uh, I'd come down with like walking pneumonia, doing a lot of work at, at, at the time, and I uh, I had trouble talking, you know, so I couldn't lecture. So I started working with Plato's dialogues in class. I had, would start to have students read passages of Plato's dialogue, and so I, I wound up just you know you know uh, for, for decades just studying Plato. Reading everything in Plato, all of the dialogues, uh, and um, the uh, what I found when I gave the, gave the students the, the dialogues to read uh, was, and it's one of the reasons I got increasingly interested in math work, was that they tended to look at the book as an oracle, an oracular. You know, it's, it was an occasional clause for them to emote. <laughs> 
And so, well, what does the text say? And so, what do I feel? <laughs> so, what, do you, what do you feel? I mean, what does it say? You know, they, they, they tell me what it's saying. You know, and they couldn't, they had no idea of how to read looking for definitions. And, you know, how to, how to uh, order definitions in terms of arguments. Huh? And how to switch in terms of, like, when a new character, like, play was great for this. New character comes in, new definition comes in, new argument comes in. Yeah. And that, uh, because they they didn't have the habit of abstraction, yeah. so it, the book just became an occasional cause for them to have a feeling towards it. Okay. So we mm -hmm. for the text. We so we so we mm -hmm. You know, like uh, one of my friends, Lou Weeks, once said that students think that test or test is a starting point for negotiation. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Will that work on Judgment Day? <laughs> I'll negotiate. <laughs> I just wanted to piggyback and just add um, something in support of what you just said. I know of a Protestant Christian apologist who calls it the humiliation of the word, and he ties it to our modern culture of multimedia and information communications technology. ICT, I saw it. Sorry, somebody's presentation. ICT was in there in your presentation yesterday. But because of ICT and multimedia, you know, you've got um, complexity of file types. You mentioned this phone. You've got text. You've got audio. You've got video. And you've got graphic or interactive. And the complexity of those file types goes from left to right or up to down, whatever. How have you ordered from text all the way to interactive? And so. If you look at that from a philosophical standpoint, what you're seeing is the humiliation of the word because the lowest level of complexity in information communication technology is text, a text file, and then you have audio, video, and then graphic interactive. And so it's been humiliated by the image. And so that's, uh, I like that, uh, that, that insight that that apologist had put forward. Yeah, now, now I would recognize that the students had a reading problem. <laughs> and, you know, so he, he had to, how to read a book and get, get the different motives for reading and so forth. But he didn't attack the notion of abstraction. Mm -hmm. you know, which, 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 which the chief problem was that they can't extract Propositional. the definition from the text and follow the argument that's, right. as it's proceeding. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, the, 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 faculty, the administrators and faculties at universities uh, have never been trained to do this. So as a result, they blame students for the fact that something is wrong with universities. <laughs> and the problem is with the the, 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 the administrators chiefly, uh, uh, and the and the faculty members, because they never learn how to read. You know, in this kind of sense, this philosophical kind of reading. Uh, as a habit, as a habit of the soul. You know, you see this also very much in therapy. It's not just to abstract the word, but the internet, the, the therapy, especially, mm -hmm. uh, especially with addicts right. uh, and younger children with mm -hmm. behavioral problems. Uh, one of the most successful forms of therapy right now is they call it dialectical behavioral therapy. It's quite simply this: you, you, you got to, they can't abstract from their senses. Even, okay, right. They get to that emotive level and they can't get out of it. They can't go. You know, and they can't go to the higher soul where your locus of control is, okay? Right. So what dialectical behavior therapy is, is you know, they, they use this to practically call mindfulness, you know, to certain other, but it's, it's, you gotta calm the patient down or calm the addict down first, okay? And just simply say, what the hell's going on within you right now? Mm -hmm. see, and, and what you're really starting yeah. to do is to get them to a level of abstraction, okay? Yeah. Out of their senses and all their emotive level. Now, here's the problem. They come from a whole educational system okay, that's very human, very human oriented, which says truth is to be found in my emotions and in my feelings. So Peter asks them to read their book there. And their hermeneutics is in their feelings and their emotions. Now, I found that the administration at the university, and this is, you know, I happened to be at St. John's, but it could have been at, you know, and, and St. John's tended to be better than most places. You know, they have the brilliant faculty members all over the place. You know, who are fighting against the, the uh, administrators who don't tend to know what they're doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they, they do a noble, you know, exert a noble effort as they do in so many uh, institutions. 
Uh, but uh, so the university would try to solve this problem by teaching students grammar. I mean, they can't find a definition on a page. You know, that's the problem. They don't know how to extract it and develop that kind of habit. And the reason that they can't do this is because they don't like books. You know, the New York students especially, they wouldn't even buy books. I, I used to check at the bookstore, you know, and then see what the people have ordered the books. And, uh, and I once failed the entire class on midterm. And the dean, I didn't have tenure at the time. And the dean called me in yeah, and said, what did you do? He said, I said, they didn't buy the books. They didn't take notes either. No. No, they didn't know how to take notes, right? Yeah. So I yeah, what for? I just I didn't want them to take notes in class. Right? I, would, uh, I don't know if Robert had one of those books. I had to write in the books. I had to write in the books. You know, and they that followed the dialogue like like that to communicate, to converse with the text. John Senior at the Integrated Humanities Program at Kansas School had the students to take notes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they reported me. They reported me to the dean. They said, so they won't let me take notes. I said, they can, they can take notes. They have to take them out of the book. You know, so they go back to the text and they communicate with the text. Uh, I was at a faculty council meeting. They had uh, at a faculty senate meeting. They had made the mistake of putting me on the faculty council. Uh, and, uh, they asked, you know, when people were talking about, well, we have to change the curriculum, you know, because we're getting complaints that students, you know, from businesses that they can't, that they can't do reading. I said, they were, Adam was talking about the same thing, how to read a book. And, uh, and I said that the problem with these students, you know, I said, what you're doing is you, you, you resemble a farmer to me who's, who's, who's got, who's got uh, you know, wants to improve the, 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 the operation of the farm, uh, and he's, he's buying new equipment, and he's changing this, changing the buildings, and so forth, you know, uh, making students feel at home like the welcoming committees at the churches now. Know, to bring people in, so uh, you, know, you, can, you can develop a brand, you know, that will make you enable you to compete with this church or that church. And I said, the problem is that the farmer then discovers that his his cows have mad cow disease. You know? And I said, this is the same same problem with your students. His students don't like books, and the reason they don't like books is because they don't know, you know, what the nature of a book, you know, with respect to what it is that you're doing, and you can't teach this by you know, changing the curriculum or, or, or having teachers some grammar try to go over and you know, do this and having this. You know. And unless you admit the fact that you don't know how to read yourself in this kind of fashion, you're never going to solve the problem. It's just going to get, get increasingly worse. Um, and that, that requires a sense of realism. Yeah, a good book that I, I read into was uh, Peter Kreft's Logic. The yeah. logic versus the systematic. Yeah, the problem with that book, though, is that he doesn't understand the nature of induction. I agree. Yeah, the abstraction, though. He, I mean, he did, he did yeah. uh, really describe the abstraction well. Mm -hmm. the, well the process yeah. of writing right. art. And that's, that's one of the problems that I have with, with, with contemporary Thomism, trying to revive Thomism, is to try to do it with logicians. Uh, because they don't tend to understand the notion of science as a habit of soul. Uh, and uh, that, that this requires whole personality change. Even with respect to reading the text, you read the text with your body. You know? <laughs> so that you, the, if, if you can't focus attention, if you're so dis emotionally dis disordered, you know? uh, that you can't concentrate uh, on, on, on the text. Uh, being brought back to, to get the, the, the physical operation becomes painful. <clears throat> so students are in that kind of a situation where but especially now, with the, 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 that, that process of trying to teach uh, in terms of, 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 of that, that uh, classroom setting uh, is, is something that uh, uh, the contemporary student is, uh, is, it, it does, does not have the habits that are conducive to doing. So you, you're much better off you know, uh, getting rid of that and using communications type of, of, uh, of, of activities with which they are more familiar to, to, to engage in those abstractive activities through conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 I have to interrupt because I have to 
leave, but I will make it. I'll bring it around to Michael. We talked, uh, he, he and I, and uh, the year my wife came along, who's uh, uh, also practiced law. Uh, we had some enjoyable shop talk and conversations with him. But uh, I have this other organization I got a conflicting appointment, which kind of takes me back to practicing law, too, that uh, you just have these conflicts that you can't get out. So I didn't want to, I'm interrupting you, I didn't want to interrupt you by walking out. <laughs> Thank you. Well, without, letting, without telling people I've been the reason. Here's a conversation about why not, not take any notes. You know, I've often had conversations about one of the reasons I walked away from homeless for so many years is because the way it was taught to me, okay, out of the manual. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking as we were talking, taking notes of Dr. Wilde, who taught, he taught us I think he was teaching from Cajetan, okay? And his favorite expression was, scribite carissime, write my beloveds, write my beloveds. He would get up there and lecture, and we would sit there. Okay. Now, this is modern day kids. This is back in the 60s, okay? Right. So the whole act of, of taking notes, but the, the way Thomas, now I, let me flash forward to about two months ago, I was talking to a priest, uh, well, I'm, I'm working with Sebastian and uh, we're publishing his books, okay? And he wants us to sell them uh, in a seminary. And I said, well, how are they teaching? And these are some Catholic, conservative Catholic seminaries where he wants to get his books published and distribute it. I said, how are, they, how are they teaching Thomas in seminaries today? Well, they use a lot of different books and so forth and different authors. I said, but do they ever ask the students to read the original text of Thomas? <laughs> and he looked at me like I was, you know, so it seems to me that there still is this thing of, even within our own discipline, or within Thomism, mm -hmm. there's no appreciation for the reading up by yourself in the, that self, the original text, you know, where I think the magic of the whole thing really happens as opposed to some commentator or some, you know, does that make sense I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. That we have still, even within ourselves, just sitting back as, I think Adam was uh, big on that. Go back to the original, okay? Right. And go back to it again and again and again. I mean, okay, how many times have I gone back to Nicomachean Ethics? Right. The first time was just looking at the menu almost. You understood. Yeah, right. I came to idolize secondary literature because those yes. people are contemporary. They're alive in our time, and we think, well, that's somehow that's yeah. the important voice. And then you suddenly you go back to the original and realize, well, those people are all wet. I wish I had <laughs> the original to begin with. It's like they're personal synthesis, but there's a lot missing there. So that, you know, that paper I idolize secondary. It's, it's not contemporary. It's like it's modern. Because I wrote a dissertation on Plato, and I was in graduate school, getting ready to write, and realized, now, have I ever really read Plato? And I realized I hadn't had a few survey courses. <laughs> which we read the apology and all the other a few things. But I said, then I read the corpus and I had to learn Greek and read the Greek. Then I had a whole different view of play. Mm -hmm. yeah. My mind had really been informed by the secondary literature. Mm -hmm. I had to basically exercise that from my soul when we started yeah. over. So that's <laughs> one of the other problems that a lot of people is the studies in contact. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For yeah. example, that they haven't read play. Yeah, well, yeah. Or, yeah. they focus well, so much attention on just <clears throat> mastering the technical jargon, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is understandable because it takes you, it takes you decades to go through the preparatory work where you would actually would need the background to understand what I'm saying, right? uh, and so you don't you, you, you don't uh, become familiar with the uh, uh, with uh, uh, Plato and then the uh, the, the transitional periods. Uh, the, the Islamic thinking and, and, and you know, the, the Middle Ages, which was thought. Uh, but the Renaissance, the conceptual definitions of this are really important. Yeah, I, I remember as a freshman, my best class in all my undergraduate was a, I was a biology major, but my theology class was my best class that I remember most from. And I had an instructor who was, uh, you know, a Thomist, and he, you know, he talked about a chair. And chairness and nature and essence and all these things. That's the first time I've ever heard any of those words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that was awesome. Just the way he was able to, in class, you know, use objects and talk about accidents and all these things, you know, was uh, a great way to teach him. Yeah. So, well, this young man, what's your first name? Uh, Brandon. We had an interesting conversation on science. On this, you were describing how you came. Okay, and it was 
And the question I was going to the original text of Thomas. Well, it was a, uh, it was, it was the summa of the summa, um, and part of that was uh, so Peter Creek has a summa of the summa, um, which tries to condense the summa theologia into yeah. something more readable. But that was because it was, you know, it wasn't a, a class on Thomas; it was a philosophy and religion class. So that was that was part of the curriculum. So it, but it was primary in a sense. But, but it was reading the text. You said something yeah. happened to you. Yeah. Text. Sure, that would happen. Uh, sure. So, uh, uh, this philosophy of religion class, um, during it, I had a crisis of faith. Um, what prevented me from going into a sort of atheistic worldview was Aquinas. It was actually the, the argument from causality. And uh, I thought it worked um, regardless. And I thought any sort of doubt was an unreasonable doubt with regard to that argument. Um, so uh, I, I was in sort of agnostic, theist, maybe philosophical theist waters. But Aquinas uh, was a major part of um, you know, helping me to hold on to faith. And he gave me hope he always seemed to have an answer. And it, it's sort of this uh, incredible thing. You know, you, you, uh, it's never fully explained. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I know. Uh, Whenever I'm struggling with a theological issue, I'm just saying, I wonder if Aquinas says anything about this. And I go to the Summa, and sure enough, not only does he say something about it, but in, in many cases he says something definitive about it. I'm like, of course this is the answer. Why, why, why wouldn't it be? And you know, and, and there's just something about um, reading Aquinas himself that you, you know he might not have the answer for everything, but he, he gives a foundation for for. Um, a lot of common questions even today. If everyone read read the Summa, we, we'd be living in a better world, I think. Um, he, 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 he clarifies so much that's obfuscated today. Yeah, you know, you can you can especially get get depressed when you see the uh, uh, see the way in which uh, 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 clerics, you know, try to uh, resolve problems without having. Intellectual background to do it, and that's why I like Bill's description of you know of his form of Thomism in mind. We call it free agent, free agent Thomism. Go and uh, you know look for other people who are interested in uh, pursuing the truth and getting at the truth and and, and working with with yeah. Saint Thomas and uh, not to, not focusing attention on these. Uh, 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 people at that, uh, that time are just uh, uh, reading St. Thomas in a kind of narrow, uh, uh, through a narrow habit, and, uh, are, are doing it to a large extent very often through secondary sources alone. Uh, um, using the commentators is great and to the extent that you know how to be using the original text and you're working with them because you can learn a lot. You have to get a lot of insights from them. That's one of the things I agree with dealing with, you know, about one of the yeah. many things. I just want to hold it again to this salt, this organization, kind of organization in person. Uh, I, of late, have been jumping around watching a lot of different ministers or priests preaching, okay? And what I'm seeing, though, is that, uh, like, for example, in sermons, incredibly disjointed. You know, again, it's almost the same lack of organization as you see in young people. And maybe the kind of pop young people. But if you go to the greater preachers, the evangelicals especially, there's a tremendous amount of organization in what they're preaching and teaching. And, and so they can get up there and preach. I'm not talking about the way out wild the evangelicals. But they can, it's so well organized, and they're so organized within themselves about it, that you're sitting there for 35 minutes or so, long and it's, 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 like you need, it's, it's that sense of organization that you find. And I think, I hate to say it, well, it's clergy, but I wondered if they're reading books anymore. And it's the same type of thing that we're getting into. And you see that in the lack of the inability. I mean, it takes a lot of time to put together a 15 minute homily. It really just takes a lot of preparation. But it's actually, I can tell there's absolutely zero I don't know, now I'm saying myself, I don't know if they would know how to prepare something. When you look at, we're talking about Adler's sermons, how he had his notes, they were organized mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. 
the Abbott didn't do that, you know, it's like, a, you know, if you ask me to give a, a 10 minute talk at a, to a company, it's going to take me three days to prepare. If you ask me to give a three hour talk, no. I get the notes, I'll give that 15 minutes. Is that, yeah, exactly. is that, and that's what the holiday is like. You know, track. But it goes, it's all going back to principles of organization within yourself. There's no more control anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the same organization. Right. So. Well, um, they should have some, hopefully, they, they, they brought some uh, refreshments for a break. Uh, I don't know if any movement out there, so I don't know what it was. Huh? Oh, good. You you heard. I know. All right. So we'll bring to eleven o'clock here for the next session.